welcome one, welcome all, and especially welcome if you're tuned in uh, from home or from your office. Uh, let me let you in on the secret. Our studio here is at SME Expo, thanks to our hosts at the Evening Standard. It's great to see so many of you down here at Excel. I'm Ollie Barrett. I'm your host, your compare for the next hour. And... Um, I'm hugely looking forward to introducing everybody. Elite Business Live, normally at about this time of year, if you don't know Elite Business Live, please our family. Uh, normally we'd be on stage about March. Uh, I'd be treading the boards with my co-host Hannah Previtt. However, this year, Elite Business turns 10 years old. The live show turns 10 years old. So we thought, what better idea than to go out on tour? So we've been unleashed, and that's why we're doing this our show here at SME Expo. So if you're just meeting us for the first time, a very warm welcome. And if you're used to being part of this community, welcome back. Um, I'm going to introduce four guests to you this morning. But before I do, let me just say a couple of things about the setup. Um, this is day one, you know this, of the SME Expo uh, on the Tuesday. It's also happening all day tomorrow. I'm saying this particularly, we've got a few thousand tuned in around the UK. So if you wanted to come down to Excel, um, then you are hugely welcome to do that uh, over the next two days. So thank you for being here in person. And uh, if you're tweeting along, uh, then please do share our hashtag for this particular Elite Business Live session is EBL2020. I'd love to know um, what you make of it at home, but also uh, in our audience. And I've allowed plenty of time for questions this afternoon. So thank you very much in advance for keeping those coming in. Right, onwards. Our exam question, our theme for the session is innovating your business model. That might be something you're doing right now. It might be something you're thinking about. It might be something a company you're close to or invested in should be doing. But how do you even begin to think about that? And what are the practical stories from the people who have done it? I'm going to introduce four people to you. I'll tell you who they are, and I'll introduce them one by one. But if I gaze towards my green room here, I'll give you a sneak peek. You're going to meet Piers Linney. Needs almost no introduction. Former Dragon entrepreneur. You're going to meet Andrea Reynolds, the founder of a business called Swoop. You'll meet Lara Morgan, the no-nonsense serial entrepreneur and investor. And you'll meet campaigner, author, broadcaster and entrepreneur Michael Heyman. Why don't you give them a round of applause just for being in the lineup? It feels like Gladiator, doesn't it? <laughs> right. I'm going to introduce them one at a time because I want some face time with each of them. Um, in the time it takes Piers Linney to walk towards the stage, I will hope to put my headphones on. He's the founder of Moblox. He is a former dragon in the den. He's also an investor in several businesses. He's the co-founder of Atherton Bikes. He's an advisor at VenturePath, and he also sits on Sky's Diversity Advisory Council. Welcome up to our stage, Piers Linney. Good to see you again. Hello, Piers. How are you? I feel like DJs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When they say it's all gone, all gone peak tong, I'm going to take that <laughs> yeah, as a compliment. Exactly, yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. How are you? I'm very good. Yeah, ups and downs, usual stuff. The usual stuff. I want to hear about the ups and the downs, actually. Here's a question. We've been drawn here to see you and because we're probably considering innovating our business model so yeah. give us a thought starter someone is thinking about that today let's get the hairs running what do you say so i've got a big one actually so i was tweet tweeted the other day that uh, i'm very leaning much into artificial intelligence and then people say oh god but this is going to change the world it's exponential change and my point is this is that ai is not going to disrupt you or take your job or destroy your business yeah. somebody using it who's competing with you is yeah so 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 not uh, uh, where, where right now they go, look, I'm so far behind on this. How, in practical terms, do I catch up and find out what the whole world's been talking about for the last three months? Or so, more? very quickly, th this technology has taken off very, very quickly. You've been in the news, but the, 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 the summary is, is that if you've got a small and medium-sized business, you can use it yeah. to grow your revenues, but more importantly and more quickly, reduce your costs yeah. or grow without your costs going up with it. So your margin increases. Yes. So you can do more with less. Okay, so, so, so lots of options there. Now, we're going to go quite quick fire on this, Piers. Someone in the audience is trying to weigh up whether they bootstrap their business going forward or go to maybe someone like you for investment. What is the one question that they should be asking themselves before they make that call? 
how far can I take it before I go and raise any money whatsoever? <laughs> Simple as that. You know, don't raise finance until you absolutely have to. Okay. But when you, when you realise you do have to, don't start too late, obviously. Yes. Especially equity. Make sure, try to know as much of your business for as long as possible. Okay, good advice. Right. You are glass half full. You're a very positive entrepreneur. Not everything's been easy. Tell me about what you've had to learn the hard way. Um, I've learned the hard way. You know, I've done it recently in a couple of businesses where sometimes you have to, I call it, don't chase rabbits down holes. So it comes a point where you have to stop and make a change. And sometimes you've got to fill the hole in and move on. So I've learned that when you're starting a bit especially, you don't want to let go of these things. But with experience over time, and it can be employees, it can be products, it can be the whole business in some cases. But just to step back, try and be objective and look at a business sometimes more coldly than you have to. Don't be too attached. I've, I've lost you, actually, yeah. Do you want this one? Well, uh, oh, I'll try a second one. Is that better? Yeah, Can that's better. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Back in the house. Back in the house. <laughs> yeah. Right, final question. Then we're going to meet our next guest. Right. Oh, no, it's gone again. Is it gone? Right, thank you. You're helping me here. I'm glad somebody is. Uh, use mine, use right. mine. Okay, well, I, I can do it yeah, from here, and then yeah. maybe I'll get another option. The team will give me what they need. But, Piers, we know each other well enough to carry on. Um, all the shtick aside, you've got a lot of lessons you've shared many times, good lessons. What have you not shared before that you're happy to share today with our Elite Business Live audience? So I'm quite private, really, on social media especially. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about my, my, name, my name's Jonathan for a start. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not actually Pierre, my first name. And uh, I'm very good on the African Doombeck drum. Oh, you, you can't. <laughs> How's that? You cannot uh, beat a drum story. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, because I wasn't quite knowing where that answer <laughs> yeah. was going to go. But stay with us, because we're going to meet our next guest, and I may get thrown a microphone. I feel like Sebastian Coe picking up the baton. But uh, thank you for now, Piers. Thank you. Round of applause, Piers Linney. And why don't we meet our next guest? She is the chief executive and the co-founder of a fascinating and very helpful business, Swoop. Let's welcome up Andrea Reynolds. Now then, I think I'll sort of stay up here until someone else puts a mic in my face and then I'll do something different. Right, very interested in Swoop, Andrea. I know we will all be. It's sort of like your trusted CFO. Remind us why it's so good and valuable, because you're helping people make choices. Yes, and it comes back to innovating your business model. I had a corporate finance firm. I was helping lots of different businesses from different sectors, a lot of them in engineering. A lot of them couldn't afford a corporate finance advisor. I was helping them on the weekends. I was like, every business needs a corporate finance advisor. No one can afford it. So I uh, then looked at what was going on in tech, what was going on in data, and how could I essentially automate myself and make it available for free for every single business out there. And so if you are looking for funding, you're looking to generate more cash in your business, you come on, you integrate your accounting software, your bank accounts if you want, and we show you back every single funding option. And that's not just loans. And this is live, I'm not gonna find a crowd. Grant fund. This done on, is it? It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I don't, I've yeah, offended, somebody. Mine, I've offended somebody in a previous life. I'm going I'm to stick to my guns, Piers. Thank you. That's okay, generous. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to hold this podium for dear life, everybody. I, f- I do feel like Judge Jules now. Here we go. More like sort of podge Jules, really. Anyway, um, Andrew, what... Um, but it's live, because often you'll find a, an, a, a pool of funding, but it's dried up. Correct. It's, it's real time. Uh, so if there's a grant out there and your business is eligible for it, you will find it on our platform. Yes. Um, and actually that's where it started from I got angry with the government about how difficult they made it for all of our business owners to fund grants and of course everybody has to ask this how have you funded it? I'm like I'm like the business case study of our platform. I've done everything. I've done grants, startup loans, uh, investment, um, and now we're on to our, our next uh, Series B fundraise at the moment. Okay, so going through that VC. Yes. Fantastic. Great. Uh, what would you like to share with our Elite Business Live audience that you have never shared before, Andrea? So the um, peak time uh, for UK business owners looking for finance uh, this year is 2 to 4 a.m. A.m. 
So if you're up, you're worried about your business, you're feeling anxious, and you think you're the only person that is going through those nighttime nightmares that we all have when starting our business, know that you're not alone. The majority of the country is doing the same if you own a business. And, and, and not to be pedantic, you mean the peak time for searching for it, right. not necessarily for finding it. For searching for it, yes. But of course, at Swoop, it's one and the same thing. Thank right? God we're digital. <laughs> right, okay. Andrea, stay with us. Thank you. Yeah. Andrea Reynolds, everybody, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> now then. I get to introduce a co-founder of Startup Britain uh, to you. You have probably uh, seen or met uh, Lara before. She is hugely helpful. No, it's you, Lara, up next. Serial entrepreneur, sold a business, has invested in many more. I'll tell you. Welcome, Lara Morgan. Hello, Lara. Hello. I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay at my podium for fear of my life. Right. I'm going to remind our audience, because you're too modest, Lara, um, you co-founded Centred fantastic business uh, and Global Amenities Direct and you have invested in many more including Yogi Bear B-A-R-E yeah. uh, Gate 8 brilliant luggage thank you thank you and Kit Bricks okay so thank you advertising now. here I couldn't help myself it's what I do there you go here it is Gate 8 luggage up in the hole so I've got a question Lara somebody sitting in front of you pitching you for investment what is the number one question you're asking yourself about that entrepreneur? I've thought about this a lot and I keep coming back to my gut feel because it's, it doesn't let me down. And so, and, in, and within that, I usually kind of come up with a one word, what do I think about this person as they're starting to talk to me? And if I find the word trust somewhere in my inner description of what I'm thinking, Ollie, then I think that's a great starting point. Can I trust this person? Because I think you have to believe when you're investing that you're going to get told the whole story and not in part. Mm. And what about those founders who perhaps struggle a bit with face-to-face -face communication? It's not their sweet spot. Go you practice. It's not an excuse. I'm afraid it's tough shit. You've got to go out and ask for the money. And women are terrifically bad at this. Right, and well if you don't keep begging, you're not going to get it. But beg in a constructive, planned way. Um, well, clearly, you've hit a bugbear. I apologize if that didn't come across too direct. Clearly. No, no, no. no. These, it's why we invite you to these things, Larry, because you are no BS. And by the way, Piers, can AI do gut? Isn't AI mm, all about the data? Um, not yet. It's not very good at understanding empathy, but it'll get there. Right, it'll I get mean, the thing about gut reaction is, if you've got experience, go with your gut. If you haven't got experience, it's stomachache. <laughs> Or something a lot worse, but we won't have time to go into that today. Right, Lara, you famously, I hope you don't mind me outing you on this, held on to the vast majority mm. of your business what before donut. selling it for a very large amount of money, £100 million. Pounds. Um, how do you feel about that in retrospect? Remind the audience how much you held on to. 99%. What and an idiot. Why an idiot? It turned out rose smelling of roses. So actually, there's quite a lot of study on this um, issue, and I, I definitely have learned this time around. So... I'm currently trying to entice Paula Radcliffe into Kitbricks, for example, in exchange for a share. Um, so that's the celebrity game. But the truth is that my microphone... Uh, yeah, it's fine. At, no. Andrea will pass the As mic. we have equity in a business, those are the most valuable chips on the table. You've got 100% of shares. You don't give away shares, you sell shares. But actually... As a leader, I think if I had properly structured a management series of, of share opportunity with skin in the game to put, buy into, which I definitely think is a necessary when you're not giving shares, someone is earning shares when it's from within the company. Yep. You know a lot more about this than I do. Um, then I think that you just see a change of attitude. So now when I invest in companies, I expect there to be a management part. I expect there to be a play around it. And... I can tell you a much longer boring story about every time I kept going, oh, I need a, you know, a management partner. And in the end, I, I had to run for the hills before they found out what, you know, that an idiot was running the show. But actually, I'd, you know, my mother had the other share. She got a great ROI. <laughs> um, but I, would, I have not done that since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we could debate about what she had to invest to get that yeah. ROI and you as, your, you as her daughter, Lara. But that, 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 again, we haven't got time for that today. What would you like to share with us for the first time today, Lara Morgan? I once borrowed £5 million from BAE for £1 a year in return for investment. Did you? Yeah. How'd you get away with that then? Uh, I slept with nobody. 
and British Aerospace was selling defense equipment to the Czech Republic and my company was a very fast growing award winning company so publicity does matter right. and I took my staff uh, to the to Barbados as a celebration because we made one million pounds in EBITDA and BAE used to word search on the words Czech because they were selling uh, uh, defense yeah. equipment to Czech so they rang me up and they and I kept batting them back because I thought you're not going to buy soap from me or shampoo what are you doing and it, finally I, I did a lot of research through a number of lawyers and they said we help British companies internationally grow in exchange for what's called inward investment yes, yes, which yes. I didn't know anything about so the lesson there, I guess, is always return the phone calls and learn. <laughs> very good. So just so we know, we're on stage with a very, very famous newspaper, The Evening Standard, but it's out of the bag now. It's all happening. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Lara Morgan. And our final band member. Well, he is a band member. He's not banned in the official sense of the word, <laughs> but he was a co-founder of Startup Britain. He co-founded the campaigning firm Seven Hills. He chairs the Small Business Charter. We'll hear more about the Help to Grow initiative. He wrote the book Mission. He's a broadcaster and an author too. Please welcome up Michael Heyman. Good morning, everyone. Yay. You might as well come on down. Well, no, stay there just in case. Right. Right. Welcome, Michael. Uh, nice to see you, Ollie. It's very nice to see you, to see you nice. You've been taking in SME Expo this morning. Apart from the headphones, biggest takeaway, what are you making of the show? Yeah, you look like that guy on The Empire Strikes Back with Lando, Ka- Lando Calarizian. He wears those on the, in, the, in the flying planet. What have I taken? <laughs> A tremendous, tremendous energy. Uh, great to be amongst fellow entrepreneurs, um, people that have got a real passion um, and a sense of excitement about business. Um, it's great to, you know, in, in, uh, in tough times, I think, uh, for the world more generally, it's great to be amongst contrarians that are seeing the world through the lens of opportunity. I have heard really, really positive things about the Help to Grow scheme that you have been very involved with. Give us it in practical terms, because there can be this sceptical tone of entrepreneurs, myself included, mm. when we hear about new programs designed to help us. Why is it good? You've seen it firsthand. Well, it's fantastic. I have to say, 5,000 entrepreneurs have, have been through it. Um, it's, uh, it's a great scheme uh, for um, businesses to get better, right? You know, it's often said in business that you should learn from your mistakes. I've always thought, why, why should that actually be just taken without challenge. Why not learn from the mistakes of others? So 60 business schools, 54, sorry, business schools are going to uh, get up to 60, I think, by, by the end of it, are delivering this program. Uh, it's a 12-hour program. Uh, you can go to a business school of your choice. It costs you £750, but the really interesting thing is the government then put £7,500 into that course um, to get you in with some of the best thinkers in business. And I think, you know, we're all guilty of spending a lot of time um, working in the business. When do you work on it? This is a great chance to do it. Really, really good, um, good, good distinction as well. Um, You've written about, you've worked with some of the leading entrepreneurs of our time. On this theme of innovating around business models, what have you noticed the best ones doing? How do they approach this? I I mean, I think back to AI and the gut. I think passion. I mean, what we care about. I mean, I think there's there's a lot. I mean, I love this word idealism. When you think about the ideas that drive people to build things, to, you know, because I think, you know, we... A lot of people could have stayed in a in a job and done lots of things, but actually, you know that that taking that risk, taking that chance, taking that opportunity to get out there and do something. I mean, usually it starts with a great idea, something that can galvanise you, something that you feel you found an opportunity, but also you can inspire people with. And I think don't lose the idealism. That's what makes you powerful. Right. So on that. As a great interviewer, you don't often share much about yourself. I've noticed. So. <laughs> Give us something today that can help us on our way, Michael, that you've never shared before. Well, okay, I've been thinking about this one, and um, I've, my, my, my day job is the gift of expression. I don't, actually, is this uh, cutting out? Shall I, shall I swap it's it over? Um, close. Okay, so my day job is the gift of expression. I'm a marketeer. My, word, my, my job is about words and language. Um, the, the thing I've never shared is that um, I, I have a... I have a very strong suspicion that I'm dyslexic. Um, and um, I, I've, I've had it rather confirmed because my youngest daughter 
um, has has been diagnosed as dyslexic over the last couple of months. And it's been a, quite a journey yeah. for me because in many respects, the thing about dyslexia, as I've learned it, is it's a superpower, right? You know, it's a, it helps you see around corners. It gives you a level of creativity. But I think, you know, having grown up in the 80s where these things were seen as a proxy for, you know, let's say more negative descriptors. Um, the, thing that I, the thing that I feel right now is that it's something that, I'm starting to sort of um, really get into it. There's a great book by a lady called Kate Griggs um, who's just written about it, which I would very much um, recommend. Kate is amazing. And by yeah. the way, a lot of her thinking, if you go on, if you search the hashtag made by dyslexia, yeah. you'll find a lot of Kate's work. Um, thank you for sharing that. Pleasure. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Heyman, everybody. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. I want... I'd like to get some questions from our audience in due course, but I feel the need for some more war stories about, if you'll forgive the expression, about innovating business models. So if you've got something from the horse's mouth, having been there, run into the brick wall, had to. Lara? Yeah, for the idiot in the room. Um, so I started my first business when I was 23. No plan, no clue, no skills. Did a bit of maths. That was very helpful. Um, and actually, I tried to be all things to everybody. And it's, a, it's an absolute terminal disease that people say yes to too much and not enough no. And I, so I used to sell toiletries to hotels, travel lodge and everyone all the way. My first customer was the Dorchester. What a donut that I d tried to then supply everybody. So the, I think the war story is, just, as you said, complimenting that, but, you know, the... the you start off with an idea and you've got to stay focused and you're going to have to have some agility to move with the market. I mean, recently I've got a, a pocket-sized spa brand that actually started as a much bigger balm, but now we've made it pocket-sized. We're, we're innovating. We went into COVID as a spa company. We're coming out of COVID as an intended FMCG company. But stay focused on the primary delivery that you intended to do and, and resist and value your time like nobody's business because you can be busy fools all day and learn to delegate. All of those things will complement your skill set and growth. All right, Lara. but hang on and feel free to come back in on this. But Piers, it's all very well to say stay focused on the first thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. But what if it's not bloody working? So that's, that, that, was, that was my, it's working there just about, that was my earlier point is that you've got to be objective. I've been through this recently with a number of businesses, including Moblox actually. So you've got to stay objective. It's a business and approach it that way. And you can't be too attached to it. Even if it's your baby, it's your hobby, it's your ambition. And that's why often you need to have external governance, uh, mentor, whatever you want to call it, non-execs, whatever you want to call them. People that can, even your friends actually, because they know who you are, yes. know what you're trying to do, right. just outside of external views on what you're trying to do. So this is helpful, helpful background. Can you give us an example, Piers, and then Andrea, of a real example of where you've, a business you've been involved in has changed its business model to good or bad effect? Well, most startups at some point do. So take Mobux for example. So we, we built, started out in te basic technology, mobile phone platform, and we're pivoting away from that now. So we're moving completely more towards helping small businesses focus on understanding artificial intelligence and real next-gen technology. Massive change. Okay, Andrew, how about for you? Uh, so for me, I think one of my war stories was I knew my customer, I knew how to get them finance, I knew the market. I wasn't a technologist, I, I wasn't an engineer, so I went down a lot of expensive cul-de-sacs with development agencies, etc. But I would say, don't be discouraged if you're not an engineer. I had to learn my way through it so that I could keep them accountable. So that was my war story. Um, for me, when I started, I... I wanted to help every business directly. And then I quickly learned it's very going to take me a long time if I'm going to grab the attention of every um, small business owner. So we actually built our technology to embed it within other brands like NatWest, yes, etc. So and you're still uh, selling sort of B2B to C. Exactly. Right. So accountants have it now. Yeah, banks okay. have it now. And that was me letting go yeah. of, of always wanting to be the one with the relationship. But actually, that's changed our, our business right. completely. Cause, interesting. Because, Michael, you're sort of... Um, confidant to entrepreneurs but you've mm. also built a business and everything from retained special projects uh, bumps in the road that you could share and we could learn from maybe well I, j just to pick up on the um, the pivot point so I suppose Netflix is your ultimate example which started off 
life thinking it was going to be a mail order, you know, DVD business, and then has become the digital giant that we we've seen today. And I suppose knowing your moment, how you see, I mean, actually, its moment was was the being rejected by Blockbuster, um, ironically, um, that actually sort of inspire the digital drive. I mean, the, the thing about this issue about about staying on point, but also knowing when you're failing, is that I mean that that is the you know, th th that's what makes this this game so difficult, right? The inflection because point. Because the inflection, you... Yeah, because, because there are moments where actually drive, determination are a good thing, but there are also the points in time where you know the game is up, right? You need to move on, you need to change. And I think that this is the, this is the really hard point on, on judgment. I mean, the thing that I, I would say, though, is that, you know, I, I assumed that I was going into a world which was about a world of answers, you know, being a consultant, being a being in in the sort of world that I'm in. I, I've actually come to the conclusion it's about it's about good questions, actually, um, and and actually questioning yourself um, on on a great many things, right? You know, in in terms of everything from what you do to your own behaviour to the way that actually you evolve in life is a really important part because I think everybody assumes that because you've founded a business, because you're at the helm, is that you've got all the answers. Right. Start with the fact it's not true. Yeah. But you can start with the fact that you can ask very, very good questions. Yeah. But that self-awareness piece, I mean, I actually disagree with... Um Peers, because I wouldn't ask my friends because my friends are quite nice to me and they lie to me about how well I'm doing. I'd ask complete strangers whether they're going to buy my product. And if they buy my product or if I'm meeting a brick wall or if they're not coming back, I think the other thing is data is gold. And exactly because of what Piers says with the AI, where we absolutely are aligned, data tells you a huge amount, but actually still being at the cutting edge. So having the bravery to go and serve in a coffee shop to discover is your product going to sell or, or having... So I read a book this weekend called Backable. Mm -hmm. It's a really good book if you want to go out and do fundraising because I'm sense checking. Have I got the? Have I got a clue? And some of the stories in it, where you know, one guy who was building an app called Rise decided to go and stalk Weight Watchers customers because he needed to talk to the Weight Watchers. But it was that hook of his passion. But he only got there through making mistakes and ha being agile, like me, not giving up selling to the three-star, two-star, four-star hotels and focusing on five-star. Yes. That's how I made my money. All right. Thank you, you Laura. Let's, let's hold that thought. Now, these four gave me both barrels when we prepared for this, saying half of our session on questions, at least from me, but mostly from you. So who's got a question? Who's got... I see you at the back. Uh, who's got a question? Hands up in the air. We'll come to you. You can say who you are. You don't have to. I'm looking for more hands. Looking for hands, or you can give it. Yes, I see you right at the back there. Why don't we go to you first? I would say in the head headphones, it doesn't narrow it down. Uh, yes, right at the back. There you go. Can you see? Yes, uh, lady there. Yes, thank Microphone. you. Microphone. We'll come across yeah. to you from the sound deck, and after we've heard from you, we'll go straight in front of you. Have Here we mine. go. Oh, we're following you. Here we are. Brilliant. I'll just go to the front. Feel free to say um, where you're from, who you are. You don't have to. So, Ruth Allen, um, founder of the Wellbeing Warrior Academy. Um, I'm super curious in the context of success and failure and being innovative is how you manage your mindset um, and you know you mentioned dyslexia as your superpower and often when you're seeking funding people can think if you have a brain health condition that may put you at a disadvantage I'm just curious as how you've how you've done that for yourself right thank you Ruth managing mindset if you wouldn't mind pass the mic in front we'll get another question and then we'll keep them coming hi I'm Eric um well, question for Laura. Um, you touched base on your first assignment of regards to to look into investor is first trust. What else do you look into? Because we get approached by many people, but we see them as not sure. So what else do you look into apart from trust? Thank you. Okay, so what else is Laura looking for? And then Andrew, I might come to yeah, you on definitely. mindset, if that's all right. But uh, why don't we do that first, if we'll share away. Thank you, Andrea. Great question, Ruth. Really, really good question. Which is why I was sharing that that nugget with you. Uh, we all go through anxiety, and um, you know, you're either on a total high or you're on an absolute low, and that's there is no in between. I think when you're an entrepreneur, uh, for me personally, I do a lot of meditation, um, and that's the thing that keeps me sane. I I ch turn off completely at the weekends, and actually, that's when my most creative thoughts come for the business. You just have to accept it's a numbers game. So I'm doing a fundraise at the moment. 
it's out there with 100 funds. Um, we've got some who are at the very late stage, but in the early days, you're getting rejected all the time. And the, the reasons you get are so bizarre. And you're thinking, well, I just don't understand this. And, and it does impact you. So you just have to grow thick skin and realize it's a numbers game. And, you know, Netflix was rejected by blockbusters. I, there's so many examples of that. But I do think doing things like, like meditation um, and, and yoga and gardening and all those things actually just takes you out of yourself. So, 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 so Andrea, and Piers, come in and just one sec. But will, will you or anyone give me something on this? And I speak as a shareholder in Calm.com, our neighbours over there I see today. Um, we think of some of these feelings, frustration, dare I say, anger, you know, um, negative emotions as things to be soothed with a balm. Can they ever be forces to tune into that take us to other? 100%. Andrea, come back, come back. Yeah, 100%. I, my, I started my business because I was angry. I was angry with the government. Um, that anger actually converted into me getting a presentation at Downing Street and actually telling them to their faces how stupid they are and how much of the taxpayers' money that they're wasting. And it was actually that anger point and the frustration at failing at getting grants for my, my clients at the time that led me to that. So actually, well, I do you. think it's a good. Thank you, Laura. I see you, but I want more from peers on mindset and then come in. So I don't, medit- I don't meditate. I don't do yoga. <laughs> I tend to work most weekends. I'm a complete you opposite. Sit with, you sit with your drum, Piers. But We've yeah, I sit there beating a drum, which is, actually, which is actually true, actually. That's one of the reasons why I got into it. But one of the things that I enjoy about it, I think most entrepreneurs, people running a business is, is you, you want to prove that you're right, almost. It's not always about the money either, actually. And part of me is, I'm sat there on a Sunday afternoon thinking, oh God, it's the, it's the challenge of trying to solve this issue to prove that I'm right often, and not just about making cash. Lara, and then I will need more questions. But Lara and Phil, please come back round to our questioner yeah. on building yeah. on that trust question. I will. Um, so actually, the best thing I can give you is there's an article in Harvard that is the 28 questions you'll be asked by an investor find it work your way through it and then practice your answers like a religion in terms of also the mindset piece I would say there's not enough people out there professionally asking for money and really investing in the learning process I'm one of I'm learning myself still practice makes perfect but the other thing that I learned actually in this reminded myself because we always forget particularly in menopause I forget bloody everything but um, the backable piece of when you're rejected, find out why. Because that why for why you haven't done a good enough job to be convincing enough about your passion or your intention or your desire to be purposeful and put back into X, Y, Z, it, it's your lack of communication, your, your error at not making clear the ambition that isn't convincing enough to get the investor on board. So I... I 21 practices of how to ask and then be prepared for rejection but learn why right fair enough very good point michael uh, okay so i'm i'm sat here while you're all speaking and i'm and i'm taken back to being 11 years old growing up in sheffield and um being 11 in sheffield in 1981 the big thing was snooker right and i can remember you know come to the crucible all of a sudden you, you forget how popular it was and i was determined to be a really good snooker player and I can remember my, my grandfather made a 90 break when he was 80, right, which is not a bad, a bad thing. And I was determined to emulate him. And I can remember playing sneaker for 10 hours straight and nearly fainting. And he took one look at me and he went, come on. And we went up to this dam. And the thing that it taught me, it was beautiful. We sat on a rug and it's one of the things, it's one of the things in my mind that I think about forever. But I don't really remember how many games of sneaker I played. And the thing that gave me was a very valuable lesson is that perspective really does matter. Right. And that when you are thinking about mindset in business, you assume that everything you are doing is the single most important thing that you will ever do. Love and it. let me tell you, it isn't. Love it. So Being a great dad is a great thing to do. Actually running a great team, being really happy about what you do, that matters, right? Visioning where you're trying to go. You can, you can drive yourself into a negative space by, by too much intensity. Yes. And I'm an intense person, right? You know, so I, I think balance and perspective are answers to um, some of those points that, that you've raised. Here. 
I like it. If you want a great break, take a great break. There you go. Thank you, Micah. Other questions? What's not being said? What do you want more? I see you there. Let's come down right into the middle, and I'm looking for other hands. Uh, I'll give you a couple, another shot if we don't get more, but here we go. Uh, just hand there. There we go. Right in there. And I'm looking for other hands on this side. We'll come to you next, and then in front. Brilliant. Please. Hi, uh, thank you. My name's Alison. I'm the co-founder of March Muses. We are a product-based business now seeking funding, having already secured a little bit of funding uh, a year or so ago. Um, we are shocked to understand that only 0.02% of black-owned female businesses actually succeed in receiving investment or any type of funding. And so I wanted to understand what tips you can share to enable us to be successful in our next round for funding. And, and let me ask you, Alison, would you at this moment value general advice or is there a specific bit of what you're going through that you'd like our panel to zoom in on for you? Well, this is our, I mean, we, sus we successfully got funding in the Dragons then last year, but now we need more money. And so whilst we endeavour to search for funding opportunities, rather than going down pit pitfalls that others may have already done, we want to avoid that. Right. And, and to help you get the most valuable answer possible, right now, where does it tend to go wrong? Where does, where does it tend to, where, where's the uh, blockage point? Well, this is the question I'm asking here, because there's obviously a reason why only 0.02% of black women get investment. Right. Uh, who would like so to go I, first? I, I was actually on the board of a British business bank, and... Uh, we wrote the research that brought this to light called Alone Together. If you haven't read it, go and have a read of that. And you're absolutely right. The numbers are they're absolutely wor far worse than the US. And part of the issue was, and this is more of a generic point, not your business, but it's about social capital. So if you're um, African, especially Caribbean, if you're a Caribbean woman, it's, it's the hardest journey to, to sort of travel. And that issue was, was that you don't have the network, you don't have the confidence, you don't have people around you that have raised finance before. You've never known anybody that's raised finance before. I go to meetings with young whippersnappers in Old Street, and they're all sitting there talking about how they're going to raise finance. They've got the pitch deck, they're investor ready. Whereas actually, if you've never experienced that, never been involved in those networks, you have no clue how to actually do it, which is why automation is fantastic. But the point is, and we've t talked about touched upon it, is there's a way of doing it. There's a process. It's a sales process. So you need to sort of go out there and learn it. The Harvard Review, maybe sign up to Swoop. And just there's a process and there's a way of doing it you need to learn. The issue between the black community, the, the female, it could be gender, it can be white working class lads. You just have no clue how to even go about it or start. And you don't think the VCs are going to take your call. And the other side of the coin we need to change is that a lot of people talking, outreaching to people like yourself, they're, they're, not, they're not diverse at all. So they don't understand you. And it gets even worse when you get to the investment committee. It tends to be, you know, white middle-aged guys. So that needs to change as well. Right, let's get some practical thoughts. Andrea? Look, I'm at the VC stage and it's 2% uh, of VC funding goes to females. The way I look at that figure is it's an opportunity. Okay, the reason it's an opportunity is because all of these funds from, from seed stage right up to, to exit stage are all being told this is unacceptable now. So they're actively looking for good quality businesses that they can say, hey, look, we are more diverse. Like that is just the reality of the world we're in. So for you, this is an opportunity. So what we need to do now is get you absolute user saying, get you ready. Um, we do investor readiness workshops for a whole day. Uh, we run them with Verge and we run them ourselves. I'm happy to review your pitch deck. It, it is, knowledge is power. And if you've got a good business, clearly you do because you've already raised funding in it. This is an opportunity for you. There are funds set aside for underrepresented groups like, like us females. So um, happy, happy to help. Uh, in the UK, you you've got Impact X, you've got Cornerstone. There's lots of funds there you can go and talk to that specialise yeah. in And this. if you're minded, and we could get lots of advice on this, the Alison Rose Review on Female Founder Businesses produced its update review in March and is a treasure trove of useful information. But um, I think our panel will be up for a chat later. Alison, how can we read more about your business? Where do um, we go? <laughs> so our website is marchmuses.co.uk. We sell black Christmas decorations. So Santas, black angels, varying skin tones, just to have representation at Christmas time. Very good. Thank you very much, Thank Alison. Thank you. And I saw an offer either in front or behind you. No, it was somebody with their hand up very close. Brilliant. There you go, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name's Michael. I'm a business coach. And the question I have to you is... You get uh, beginning especially completely flooded with loads of people wanting to give you advice wanting to get you through stuff and 
you haven't actually really got the ability to scale it to get an idea of what's happening where do you take your resources from where do you take your mentoring from how do you work around growing yourselves and learning throughout the process mm. I, th- I think there are stage gates clearly in development and that's what you're asking about. I mean, I made the stupid mistake of being the lonely entrepreneur. Another, you know, so actually getting into a network of other like-minded individuals locally, you know, attending stuff that banks put on for free and all the accountants and the bloody annoying lawyers turn up, but there's usually one or two people that could be really helpful, like-minded Lara, people. on that, give, give us an example, because we're all trying to sort the wheat from the chaff, yeah. apart from ones we've already mentioned. Any programme, platform, apart from elite business, uh, that's great. What is really good? Well, I, I do think Virgin do good work, but, um, you know, and then you'll... I mean, I graduated into the business growth programme at Cranfield, and there's a London Business School thing, which it, it is worth checking out, but also... You know, it is online. I mean, I built my business by buying books from the business section of WH Smith's and I sold it for 20 million quid. So it's inexcusable not to be learning all of the time. Because there is a perception, Michael, that entrepreneurs get kicked out of classrooms. They don't go back into them. Mm. And, and your day-to-day is slightly proving the opposite of them. Yeah, well, I think there's never stopped learning. Before just answering that, I just want to say to the lady's question earlier is that that, I think, is a really important question. I think to the point about Impact X, as an entrepreneur called Eric Collins, he's written a book called We Don't Need Permission. You should get it, Great read book. it, because I think this thing about... Name and fame, but also name and shame in that experience is a really important part of it. Okay, so on on this, I think um, if you're in a large corporation, then the idea of continuous improvement is not a not you know is not is not alien to the experience of of people that go through that. Um, I think that um, as as an entrepreneur, you do need to learn, right? And I think that 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 speaks to, to Laura's point about the lonely entrepreneur is that the biggest danger of that is you become isolated, you lack um, channels of knowledge into your business, and, and that can lead to very poor decisions. Yes. You know, it's not just that you know your your life is about the accumulation of mistakes, and that's what gives you perspective. I mean, you need to be able to to sort the the signal from the noise, so the people that are around you that aren't just trying to sort of feast on you, make money out of you, but are genuinely there uh, to work with you and, work, and and help you. But you also have to commit yourself. You know, I, I mean, I've always been thirsty for knowledge. I mean, it's a it's an important part of how any business grows is that you've got to keep it fresh. Yeah. And the minute you get comfortable and rest on your laurels like that, it's probably a time to, to, yeah. to so, bag so it in. <laughs> brilliant advice. So, so we can get lots more on this, but I, I want to get, a, there was somebody in front of you or behind you. I see you. Brilliant. Tell us who you are if you'd like to. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Marissa Corda. Um, I've spent the last 10 years as a general counsel and I'm moving to setting up my own business now. Um, and it's an app-based product, so maybe more for Andrea as a question. But how do you filter the feedback that you're getting? Because I'm getting a lot of it, um, the, the nuggets of wisdom that will make the product better versus people's opinions, because it's coming from all directions at the moment. Uh, and I'm not sure if you have any tips or tricks for how to process all of that. By the way, have you got? An, we're, we're never afraid of a plug here. Have you got a name for it yet? Uh, not yet. Okay, right. Watch this space. All right. I think we've very similar journeys. We literally, I was just having that conversation with Laura before we came on stage. I left, I left KPMG to start my business. So similar, I, I was doing extremely well. And then when it came to setting up my app, um, I wanted to do whole of market. I didn't just want to do lending. And every single person in the industry told me, you need to focus on one product line. You can't be distracted doing breath. And I was like, no, you're missing the point. Businesses need every form of funding. Like, debt isn't always the answer to them. And so if I'd listened to the you know, the entrenched industry people, I would have just gone with, with loans and that wouldn't have solved for my, my customer. So I, I listened to my customer. I did um, everything that's on the platform I used to do manually. And when you see the reactions of your customer sitting next to you and you're teaching them about, you know, how to improve their cash flow and how to get more out of their services by paying less, et cetera, that's the feedback you want to listen to. Okay. Interesting. And, yeah. I, I, I'd add to that, though, that when you've got a, cut, a target customer who's done the research, I'm actually a lawyer by training as well, something else people probably didn't know either, um, is that uh, don't ask your customers or your research sort of target for the answers. Ask them for their problems. Now, you've got to factor in some of the answers, obviously, but you're the one with the vision. You're the one that's going to take the problem and kind of come up with a solution. And then what you then do is test it with them and iterate it over time. 
So keep it kind of lean and mean, but never go out and say, tell me how I should design my app. You listen to the problem, design it with your know-how, your vision, and then show them, listen to, that's the key thing, yeah, well, iterate Ollie, it very Ollie, quickly. Let me in, Nara, come, let in, me Nara, in. come on. Procrastination, right? It's going to cost you. There's no such thing as perfect. Quite a lot of people piss me off because they're just waiting for the perfect and they say, I've got this great idea, and I go, what are you doing with it? Right? So I think there's a great Darwin quote around adaptability, right? But actually, how many of you have written down something today and you are going to promise yourself that you're going to action that thing that you've learned, something interesting that these others have said? Because people sit in rooms all of the time and they go away and they do nothing different. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. So the con- you can't help yourself, can you? <laughs> I sat in a room with five people and the head of Microsoft AI to talk about ChatGPT about two months ago. And uh, we were going down a path with our product development. I walked out of that room and I was going, I am buzzing. This is going to change everything. And I was saying, how am I going to convince everyone at work this is what we're doing. So everyone's on this journey. And I brought my old Nokia phone and I said, you see this? I remember when I was in university, chief marketing officer of Nokia arrived and he said, soon you're all going to be living off this your entire lives. And we were all going, don't be ridiculous. That's an ugly looking brick of the thing. And, uh, and, and then of course we all did. I was explaining to them, I sat in a room, I could go, oh, that's interesting uh, and ignore it or we can get on with it. We released our first AI feature yesterday and we're basically pivoting our entire business Gosh. to hyper personalization through AI. I love it, right. And it was moving on that on the talk. So on this, <laughs> if you're just joining us, this is Andrea Reynolds, founder of Swoop, next to Piers Linney, Lara Morgan and Michael Heyman for Elite Business Live here at SME Expo. We've got about eight minutes left, so I see you, which would be your second question, which is good. That's the sort of sort of thing we like here. But if you haven't got a question, if you haven't asked a question you'd like to, raise your hand now. I see you there, sir. Why don't we go to the back because you've been very good. Thank you. Uh, you and then this chap here, four rows back. Thank you. Okay, Ruth Allen again from the Wellbeing War Academy. So my um, vision is to set up a functional brain imaging clinic and supporting community online that leverages the power of AI. I'm just curious to know, in the context of chicken and the egg, which, which is better to come first? Is it better to generate the AI uh, online first and then build the, the supporting infrastructure that leverages the power of AI or do you s- support the, the first vision of the product that you're creating and then build the AI afterwards like Andrea was mentioning so, go on former dragon Piers Linney this is like people say it's more all the time I want to build an app I'm like well what's it going to exactly. do I don't know I just want to build an app so don't worry about the AI so, so the, the beauty of AI is and we should all understand this is that those deep tech platforms have rapidly becoming commoditized so you can access that AI, the GPTs, LLM, whatever it's going to be, to do specific things. So again, going back to the earlier question, just focus on the problem, how you're going to solve it. The technology increasingly becomes its secondary. Don't try and let the technology drive you. And the issue you've got with AI is, by the time you've created something today, it's out of date next week. Yes. So always focus on the problem. Right. Very briefly, the thank you, Piers. Easy. Thank you. Very you briefly. also need your, your human intelligence to apply to the AI. So, so go with what you're doing. Okay. Right. Thank point. you. Michael. But, well, I think there's also, there's the plumbing, which I'm, is what AI is going to become, right? And then there is the poetry in terms of your vision and idea that goes with that. I mean, last year it was the metaverse. Let's not forget, everybody was going to be living in the metaverse <laughs> this year. Uh, and the, these earphones would be about as far as, as close as we've got it. This year, AI is driving the conversation. Nobody's saying it's not important. But nevertheless, it is a tool and it is a means to an end. And the end is really important, right? What you're trying to achieve. And I think that don't get, don't get sort of like um, blinded by the fact that actually AI in of itself is a functionary tool it's not going to give you the differentiation that you seek but what you aim to do your purpose your impact and your mission might well be yeah love that right now let's get this gentleman's question in here and then we may have time for one more i see you right behind here we have we brush that down the middle here stick your hand up sir here we go thank you very much and i'll take these final two and then i'm going to round up a bit go please hi uh, my name is ron Mukherjee, and i'm a debt entrepreneur um so i'm also a lawyer as well (laughs) Um, my question is to all of you is I'm actually in the process of creating a credit control application called Credit School um, and that's going to become the Rolls Royce of credit control 
for small businesses and accountants. In the light of Silicon Valley Bank and pre-seen investment, that's where I am going at the minute, and I know what you said about... When you say that's where you're going, what do you mean? Yeah. Um, what I mean is Silicon Valley Bank has gone bust, so it's persevering as a founder to try and go and get investment. What tips would you, and tricks would you give to persevere? Okay, so tips and tricks on perseverance, and let's just take that final question from behind you in the nice purple jacket. Lovely. Thank you. Right behind this gentleman. Thank you very much. Hello, um, my name is Godzi. Um, I'm a fashion. I'm in fashion. Um, I'm building a, a tech app for the fashion industry um, about sizing. Um, I just wanted to um, find, um, ask about people. Business is really about people, and I wanted to find out, like you know, how you can. Um, get the right CTOs and the right pe bring the right people together to make your business really strong because yeah you can have a good idea but you can't do everything yourself right. and um, thank yeah, you forgive me say, say the name of your business again um, it's Gozi Design Limited Gozi Design Limited fantastic uh, Lara will you help people. us on people and yeah. then uh, from anyone on resilience if you would thank you I mean the people it, it's you don't need to say how critical it is, but then the question is how much effort and time are you putting into that recruitment process and to really getting to know the pro person. And as a business evolves, they spend much more on it and then they stupidly don't work on loyalty and retention, which beats me, but there's methods and that's changing. So recruitment-wise, whatever the role, it always starts with a very clear role description. What's the job the person's going to do? And you need to define that because you've got to define a skill set against it or else you shouldn't be having conversations and that's the you know the early stage startup mentality is we employ friends and people that we know but we don't professionalize the people and the better the professionals the better they are than you the faster you will fly yeah. so time and effort spent in recruitment and then as a business matures you don't need to do all the recruitment but you do need to set a cultural language within your business so that those that are recruiting on your behalf recruit people of like mind, okay. not like skill, right? And, and, and the brilliant thing in the early stage is you can shape those relationships. And then I will absolutely tell you that there isn't a business in the world that doesn't outgrow either the founding partner or other members of the team. And so the honest conversation about when you're recruiting people and saying, look, you know, you're either going to be stepping sideways or stepping out. We've got lots of grown-up ways to have this conversation, do it professionally and legally, but protect the people core, yeah. right? Good. Spend time can, can on I it. Can I ask, Piers, come back in, but Michael, I'm consistently impressed by your team members over the years. Mm. What have you learned about getting the best? Well, I think you have to be, you know, have a pretty good sense of what you're trying to do. Um, you have to have some sense of what perfection might mean in terms of in terms of the goal that you're going for and i think that you franchise that i mean i think i think the two points i'd say is that you know one is that high people are on the way up right you know you, you sort of think oh, i've got to get a team sheet of people that have got these you know inc incredible track records you're high for attitude i mean that's a you know people grow with you when you're a startup and i think you need to bring people with you you need yeah. to get people on board the second thing if i just may say about resilience and investment is Brian Chesky, who is the, the co-founder of Airbnb, said something absolutely amazing a couple of weeks ago. Um, just think about this, right? He said that working in tech has been like being in a 10-year disco and somebody just turned the lights on, right? You know, that actually all of a sudden the lights have gone on and loads of investors have turned around and gone, oh my God, what have we invested in? And they're actually being, you know, there's a lot of chickens have come home to reach very, very quickly. This feels very similar to the era, um, you know, 2011 or so, when, when Ollie, Laura, and I co-founded Startup Britain, right? You know, the answer to your question is it's not going to be easy. Yeah. Silicon Valley Bank did not go bust because it was a good bank. Let's, yeah. let's be clear about that. You know, I, there are going to be more testing environments, and but you can get sharper. Space. And yeah. the, all the portfolio now yeah. with HSBC, good luck to everybody there. Yeah, we start on people quickly. So there's, there's, recruit, there's recruiting people. There's also co-founders and partners. So Atherton Bikes, for example... I got a DM on Instagram from a famous mountain biker saying, I want to start a mountain bike company, but I haven't got a clue. So he reached out. So I put together the elite athletes, the technologists, and myself, more structure, putting it all together. And we created a company, which is now one of the world's leading mountain bike manufacturers. But if you haven't got the athletes, the know-how, the tech, and maybe some business non-know-how, that would never have happened. So sometimes it's, you know, I'm, 
it, so, maybe a co-founder while we so what so what do we say then Andrea somebody sitting with us today or tuning in on Elite Business Live they're on the threshold of a big decision to their business model um, are they going to retreat to their boardroom to finesse the plan do they have to tell each and every one of the t- just give, give us a practical tip on how to do it just do it I'm not being funny you do it you get comfortable with failure you you and and here's one thing I do every year when the whole company's together the first thing I start with is I'm about to tell you about all the mistakes I made this year and how much I've cost the company and then everyone else goes oh she's really honest about all the mistakes she's made it's it's part of actually finding your business. Just it, stop talking about it. Just get on with it. It's going to hurt. It's going to fail sometimes. And then you just pick yourself up again and you, you go again. But that's okay. it. Very briefly, Lara, final word on this. I think, it, I think you're absolutely right. But I think um, the, that honesty piece and your comment about self-awareness, everything in leadership will come back to your success is built around your vision and your culture and the way you represent it. So control of self, discipline, you know, constantly preaching the message, driving the culture, making fair decisions over everybody in the business. You know, in the end, the people can, piece can either make you or break you because without great people around you, you won't growth accelerate. So, you know, some people are, are much better with a co-founder. I'm a miserable, I prefer to drive it myself. I've, I've worked out I'm a habitual loon and I like to run it that way we're all different you must choose what's right for you what feels right and then you have to live with your decisions but Warren Buffett like you we were talking earlier you know he puts up his hand every year and goes all the mistakes and and the more you can be honest about characteristic skills weaknesses gathering experts around you because you're rubbish at filling in boxes you don't like the mass you can't stand the budget then work really hard to get great people yes and, and let them know that you, you and, and look to them and trust them. Thank you, Laura. That will, that will be our final word for today. I've got a good update coming for you. But for now, thank you for your questions. Will you say a huge thank you to Michael Heyman, to Laura Morgan, to Andrew Reynolds and to Piers Linney? Thank you very much. Uh, exclusive news here. Um, this is the second live tour date, if you like, of Elite Business Live this year. We're going to be going to Atomicon. Uh, taking over the main stage on the 13th of July in Newcastle. So please join us there or tune in on the Elite Business Live platform. By the way, the session title there, I think you might like this, will be Elite Business Nightmares Uncovered. Sounds like one for Channel 4 there. Uh, Exclusive stories of adversity. So uh, you'll catch me again on the programme as we keep our live tour going at the Technology for Marketing National Expo. And I'm going to be co-hosting that in September this year. Please keep sharing what you've taken from this on EBL 2023. And the programme here on the main stage at SME Expo will continue in a couple of minutes' time. Thank you very much. (laughs) 